I'm Sarah A. Chrisman, the author of The Tales of Chetsumoka and various other books about the Victorian era. I hope you've been enjoying them and remembering to tell your friends about them. Now, this is another themed clump of little videos about home repairs, because some of you have asked for that. And uh, this one is about the heating system. When we bought our house, we knew just by looking at things that the original radiators weren't functional in their current state. Since these were the only source of heat in the house, and winters in our area get down to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, we knew that the heating system would have to be a priority. Our plan was to hire a professional heating expert to reinstate the system before our first Iowa winter. But as the Scottish poet Robert Burns said, the best laid plans of mice and men are off to gong a glee. Maybe if we'd been closer to a big city or on one of the coasts, we might have found someone qualified to work on an old system like ours. But those sort of specialized professionals are few and far between in obscure rural areas. Adding to the problem, in 2021, when we were doing this, lining up any sort of contractor anywhere at all was next to impossible for all but the simplest quick turnover jobs. And our job was far from easy or quick. The one guy who said he'd be willing to have a go at it turned out to be grossly incompetent. To make a very long, painful story short, between personal phone calls that lasted for hours, running power tools over the original antique stenciling in portions of the house he shouldn't have been in to begin with, and generally making my life a misery for an entire summer, he managed to install a steam boiler on our hot water heating system. Now, for those of you who are new to this, and I certainly was at the time, steam radiators and hot water gravity radiators are entirely different systems. Installing a steam boiler on a hot water system is a bit like filling the tank of a gasoline-powered car with diesel and saying, hey, they're all the same, it'll be fine. Well, it wasn't fine. And by the time we sent the incompetent guy packing, I was halfway to a nervous breakdown. Not to mention the year was deep into autumn. We were facing a Midwest winter without heat. And so Gabriel stepped up to the plate yet again, and the saga of recommissioning our radiators began. The guy who'd put a steam boiler on a hot water gravity system hadn't even looked at the radiators themselves, and they needed a lot more than looking at. They needed serious work. So, the old radiator valves are extremely corroded and so they're completely locked solid so you can't adjust them or do anything um, and a lot of them we don't know whether they're open or closed and so really these valves have to be replaced um, the difficult part is that while you can get some basic manual radiator valves these days the threading has changed on a bunch of these things most notably this part, what is called the union threading. Um, Which this, part? Point at it again. This part right here. So these are standard pipe threads. This is what's called the union thread. And the standard for threading unions has apparently gotten coarser over the course of 114 years. What has not gotten coarser over the course of 114 years? Correct, what has not. Cruder, means, coarser. Correct. That means that I have to replace not only the valve here, but also what's called the spud, which is this bit that goes and threads into the radiator itself. Now this thing, in order to get it out of there, because this just spins, um, basically I have what's called a spud wrench, which is this large and ungainly piece of cast metal, which has to be thrust into the hole here, and then, has to be wrenched upon. This is probably not going to come easily, and that's why I have a torch here to heat it up, if, ne if need be. 
or a heat gun if I don't need to go quite that far. Um, and a big, big, big wrench. Not only is this one stuck in there by rust and everything, but it's also been painted in just to add insult to injury. in the closed position. Uh, you can tell by looking in here and seeing it's completely blocked off. Ah, yes. And rusted in place. You can see how hard I had to wrench on it to get it apart. Right. Um, and that's just one half of the valve, basically. On one radiator. On one radiator. Out of 14. Yep. Now this one was originally a beautifully nickel-plated brass one. Unfortunately, such are not available easily in this country anymore. Um, and so we'll be replacing it with a simple brass one. You mean we don't get to go to the mystical land of make-believe? I would like to go to the mystical land of make-believe. I think or, that would be rather pleasant. Where we can just buy these things? That would be wonderful. Now one of the difficulties is that these new radiator valves are of course about half an inch shorter than the other ones, the originals, meaning that unfortunately that means in order to get them to line up properly I have to raise this pipe a little bit, which means going downstairs and just kind of forcing it up. Sometimes. So that's a spud remover? This is a spud wrench, yep. It's quite the tool. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Or the Dark Crystal. A little bit like that, it, yeah. It looks like something out of the Dark Crystal. Feel it. It's, I know it's heavy. Oh, good land. Yes. That's what, eight pounds? Probably more. Yeah, that's and it's heavy. Very strong cast material. Uh, my hope is it doesn't just round over and strip out. Yeah. My hope is the inside of the pipe doesn't round over and strip out. Basically inside the spud, here's the new one so you can see, there's two little lumps. Mm -hmm. That means that when you put this onto the spud wrench, those two little lumps drop in like that mm -hmm. into the grooves so that you can turn this threaded section without needing the wrench flat since those just spin. You know. <sighs> Yay. Nope. No. Rounded over my tool. Uh. Or rather, broke off the things on the inside of the wrench. Or inside of the pipe. Oh dear. That was the piece that the spud wrench was meant to engage with to turn the pipe. Mm. And unfortunately, it just broke right off. So, now what? Dremel tool. All I can do at this point is cut it, cut this nut off. Then I've got to cut the thing, grab it with something like this, try to get it to turn. Any, basically, I've got to cut this nut off because it's just going to get in the way. Um, but it's time for the drummel tool and my gloves. So now I've removed the, the spinning union nut so that I can get at the actual pipe. And now I'm just trying to put a giant pipe wrench on the thing and I'm going to try to turn it. So after a great deal of wrestling, the spud has been removed. You can see exactly how tortured it had to become by the time I got it apart. It's a little crimped. And you can see also that the two little spud things inside there, one was long gone and the other one I broke off trying to get it out. This thing is brass and so of course it's pretty soft and that's why the wrench was just squishing it while I was trying to get it out of there. And so now it's ready for me to put the new one on. What's the wrench made out of? The wrench is steel. Ah, steel versus brass. Steel versus brass. We know who wins. And it's steel with a lot of leverage and big teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it says heavy duty on it. 18 inch. It's a big wrench. I wonder if that's the one from the Clue game. 
It certainly could be the one from the Clue Gang because this looks like the appropriate style, right? Yeah, it's a it's murder. It's definitely a murder weapon. It's a murder re weapon wrench. In fact, this one's you know heavy and big enough that it would be a kind of clumsy and unwieldy murder weapon. <laughs> you know, personally, I'd go with something well at this 14 inch here, <laughs> uh, or even this very nice maneuverable monkey wrench. Well, I'll bear that in mind if I ever write a book set in the Clue world, but I think that's been overdone. I think it's been overdone, too. But then again, so I'm trying to get it to go back where I want it, bit by bit, a little tiny bit by little tiny bit, and it keeps on just wandering right back it's about where it wants to be. 400 pounds? Oh, no, more than that. That's my guess. 500? Something like that. Certainly way too much for me to lift. Mm. I can't even really lift each end of it. <laughs> Little old 500 pounds? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Little old 500 pound chunk of cast iron. Little tiny feet that wants to fight me. And I can tilt it, see, but tilting it doesn't actually move it. It just tilts it. Look, tilt. <sighs> too bad we don't know Eugene Sandow. Yeah, I could use Eugene Sandow right now. Tell Resurrect him, pull him out of his grave. <laughs> but tell the folks at home who Eugene Sandow was. Eugene Sandow was the first modern bodybuilder, first modern scientific bodybuilder, and the man for whom we can thank lots and lots, well, we can thank him for many, many things, including mirrors and gyms. He was a big proponent of that. Basically, um, Arnie Sch Arnold Schwarzenegger is a Eugene Sandow wannabe. Yes. So, we have to move it. Look at how small that is, right? Look at how short that distance is we have to move it. Just that little bit, just back this way, like this, just a little bit, and then rotate it just a little bit so that this end lines up with that. Only the thing's so darn heavy and the divots in the floor are, well, they really want it to go in one place. And that place is no longer where it belongs by, you know, several millimeters, and uh, it doesn't want to go there. So Sarah and I will wrestle it in place, right? <laughs> I told you to get help with this step. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't. Mm -hmm. It's a bonding experience. I told you to get help. <laughs> I need help in many ways. <laughs> Here you can see the marvelous application of the wisdom of the ancients. It was my idea. It was Archimedes' idea, my darling. Yeah, but I was the one that reminded you of it. Yes, yes. So, details, yeah. details, right? Details, details. I was the one who remembered my Archimedes. Come on, give me some yes. credit. So the goal here is now we have a fulcrum. We have two two by four levers. We're going to attempt to use these levers to lift this thing and uh, pivot just a little bit and let it back down. So that is the challenge. Let's see what we can do. Well, one radiator down and where to go, but we have a valve that now actually works. We can shut it all the way, and you can unscrew it all the way, and hopefully somewhere in the middle will be the proper setting once I get a boiler installed. Um, but we're going to be able to adjust things, which is going to be very important when it comes to balancing the heat. Um, I got this end reconnected as well, and hopefully nothing's going to leak once I get everything actually uh, flowing through it, but it seems to be pretty solid. So, we will uh, knock on wood. We will knock on wood. We've got lots of wood here, so. We do have lots of wood. Um, but yes, that's a, uh, that's a start. And now I've seen sort of what it takes, and uh, I've got a few more valves to work with, and then I'll have to get proper sizes for the other ones, uh, which I'm sure I can find somewhere. Tolstoy's famous Victorian Russian novel Anna Karenina begins, quote, All happy families resemble one another. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Unquote. Gabriel could well say something similar about radiators. As he continued recommissioning the radiators throughout our house, each one seemed to present its own unique challenges. Every unhappy radiator is unhappy in its own way.